you. I now call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. On the issues of poverty and inequality, I think it's worth saying from the outset that no political party and neither side in the referendum campaign has a monopoly of wisdom, and certainly not a monopoly of concern either. Although we've so far reached different conclusions about how we might cast our votes in September, Malcolm Chisholm's speech, I would say, is one of the most substantial uh, and high quality that we've heard on the subject. And if we were only uh, looking at the issues of poverty, inequality and childcare, I might agree with him about the merits of Devo Max. I hope he comes to uh, agree in the end that we're discussing the referendum on the issues uh, covered in this debate, as well as on others such as Trident, uh, which I know he has similar concerns uh, as I do. Often it's governments which appear to claim such monopolies of wisdom or of concern. Sadly, Today, it was the leader of the main opposition party, uh, had, I have to say, who appeared unwilling to accept that her opponents have a shred of genuine concern uh, about these issues. I have areas of common ground uh, and areas of disagreement with Joanne Lamont, just as I do with the First Minister. And it's sadly one of the um, falsehoods, I think, of, of our current political mode uh, that very often the parties on different sides of the independence campaign find it hard to acknowledge their common ground. I agree with the First Minister about how I'm going to cast my vote on 18th of September, but we don't always agree on the reasons. After dealing with Gavin Brown on, on real-term spending versus absolute numbers, the First Minister went on to talk up his ambition for a, a competitive tax environment in an independent Scotland. One of the principal means by which corporations have forced governments around the world to accept the level of taxation those wealthy businesses choose to pay is tax competition. The only alternative uh, governments feel is to watch them disappear toward lower tax environments. I'll be voting yes in September this year because I want to challenge that, not because I want to comply with it more effectively. I do want, in a moment, I do want, as the First Minister argues, to design tax, welfare and public service policies in a coherent way, designed for the needs of Scotland's people. We won't be able to achieve that if we're designing tax policies to serve corporate interests instead. I give way to Mr Neil Finlay. Mr Harvey confirmed that none of the countries mentioned has been exemplars of social progress, like in th those in Scandinavia, have the tax competition policy that's been pursued by the Scottish Government. Patrick Harvey. Absolutely, and, and Mr Finlay and I have agreed on many occasions and will continue to do so on some of those aspects. I do believe that independence gives us the opportunity, it opens the door to allow a challenge to the kind of tax competition which successive UK governments and the current Scottish Government uh, continue to accept. Unless we open that door, we won't have the ability to challenge it, uh, never mind the reality. On free school meals, the, government's, uh, the Scottish Government's announcement today, I very much welcome the steps in this direction. I would like to ask one query, and I hope that this can be dealt with in closing speeches. Is the Scottish Government's position now restricted to primary one to three for financial reasons only? Or is the Government now saying that universal free school meals uh, are a principle they wish to see applied throughout the school, uh, the school career of, of young people? If it's right for primary three, why is it wrong for primary four? Is it only because of financial constraints that this is as far as we can go at the moment? Or is this government's, government seeking a long-term move towards universal free school meals for all children? On childcare, briefly, one more intervention. Clarify Malcolm what Chisholm. the White Paper says. The First Minister referred to 159, page 159, implying there was an extension of free school meals, but page 159 says we plan to maintain access to passported benefits such as free school meals. So I hope the First Minister will apologise before the end of the debate. Patrick Harvey, I can give well, you a little bit of extra time. I'm, I'm sure Mr Chisholm doesn't expect me to be held accountable for what the First Minister might or might not apologise for, and I, I forget... I, 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 Apologise that I haven't yet memorised page 157. Order, uh, please. Of the I white can't paper. hear the member. Uh, on 
childcare provision. Some opposition voices are quite right to point out that childcare is a devolved policy area and that any Scottish Government since 1999 could have done more. This is true. But power devolved was always power retained. At present and in future, if Scotland remains part of the UK, we can only increase childcare provision by cutting something else. And despite the, 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 the comments from Mr Bibby earlier in his remarks, I don't remember a Labour finance minister during the eight years of, of Labour Liberal coalition uh, taking Barnet consequentials and using them to commit, commit long, to end, long term to a new ongoing cost as a flagship policy. I don't think that would have been a responsible thing for any government to do under devolution. Childcare could be improved as social policy under devolution, but the coherence of social and economic policy, including tax uh, and welfare, as the First Minister suggested, does need a yes vote. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, one last comment, because there is one last question which arises about Scotland's future, which I regard as just as important, perhaps even more important, uh, than the outcome in September next year. Can our politics move beyond the tribal hostility which too often characterises our debate? Every one of us Every one of us will have the responsibility from September 19th onwards to accept the result with humility, winners and losers alike, and find a degree of mutual respect in future, which may be hard to find in the heat of the campaign itself, but which we'll need to try and find if we're going to serve the interests of Scotland, whichever result the people of Scotland choose. Thank you. And I now call Neil Findlay to be followed by Mark MacDonald. President officer, it's a class war and my class are winning, but they shouldn't be. Not my words, but the words of Warren Buffett, one of the world's most successful investors. And he described how the finance houses, the banks and the powerful elites turned a global financial crisis that they themselves created into a war on the poor, the weak and those who played no part in creating the crisis in the first place. And in his analysis, uh, and, and his analysis is made real by the actions of the present UK government. It sickens me to the pit in my stomach to see Osborne and the braying crew of old Etonians in their all-out attack on the unemployed, the disabled and the poor. And they, as Buffett said, are inflicting class warfare via brutal and degrading welfare cuts, whilst at the same time cutting taxes for the wealthy and the big corporation corporations. This approach should be an affront to all decent human beings. Certainly take an intervention. Annabelle Dewing. Uh, to the member for taking the intervention. Um, why, can I ask, therefore, is the member happy to campaign with these people who he describes as despicable yeah. to seek to have the people of Scotland vote no on the 18th of September? Neil Finlay. They're despicable because they're Tories. They're not despicable because they want to keep the United Kingdom together. <laughs> And Warren Buffett's comments. Order, Warren, please. Warren Buffett's comments get to the Order. nub of the big issue in politics: the divide between those with power, wealth, and influence, and those who don't. And this is central to my approach when considering Scotland's future. I want to see a Scotland that's governed in the interests of ordinary working Scots, a Scotland that works in solidarity with our friends and relatives across the United Kingdom, developing a collective ethos based on values of dignity, cooperation, community and social progress. A Scotland that has democratic and socialist values at its core. And to achieve that, I want further devolved powers, not just to this building and this set of politicians, but devolved along the principles of democracy and subsidiarity, with power brought to the lowest and most appropriate level, where we re-empower local government by repatriating powers to councils. Councillors must be allowed to make decisions decisions on school meals, on childcare and many other, issues that they, uh, uh, many, usher, many other issues that they have an interest in. They have to be able to lower, no thank you, or increase taxes to meet local need and spend money how they see fit. They will, after all, be held to account for those decisions by the electorate they represent. We need to trust the people to decide, not grab powers to the centre and dictate to them. Uh, quality public services also need a progressive taxation system, a policy based on the ability to pay so that higher earners pay more. I'll pay more to finance good quality childcare, free school meals and education. 
But you can't finance these things and provide tax cuts. It's simply not credible. A recent poll suggests that in relation to local taxes, the public take a slight similar view, with 60 per cent prepared to pay more council tax for better services, including childcare. And not for the first time, the people seem to be ahead of the politicians on this. And across the world, as Patrick Harvey mentioned, laugh curves trickle, trickle down Mr. economics. Mr I'm so sorry, could I stop you for a moment? Could members please stop shouting to each other across the chamber? Neil Finlay. It's quite, quite all right, President Officer, the noisier the get, the better it is. Um, Laffer curve trickle-down economics has been discredited and rejected. There is no evidence whatsoever that tax competition creates jobs and growth. None whatsoever. And if it does, then does the Finance Secretary really think that the Germans, the French and the rest of the EU wouldn't have caught on to it? Does he think he's discovered, discovered some great wheeze that no one else has realised? Tax competition will be a disaster for working people and it will suck £350 million a year out of public services like childcare, like education and all the rest. And inevitably, inevitably it will be the low paid, the poor, the weak and the vulnerable who will suffer most. I reject that approach in its entirety. So I want to maintain this, the economic solidarity which sees cash transfers from areas of wealth in the UK to areas of most need. That is a good thing. And what about some other issues? I want to see the living wage implemented now across every sector in which the government has any, influ any influence. And yes, in child care, for childcare workers too. Patrick Harvey. <coughs> Grateful to the member for giving way. I just wonder if he could tell us how he intends to achieve these things across the UK, because as we know, under Tory, Labour and coalition governments, we've seen more or less the same corporation tax policy. Does he intend to vote Green? Because I think that's the only option down south. Neil Finlay. Mr Harvey, the, the corporation tax policy, that, as applied by different governments, is fine as, 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 low as, as long as it's consistent across the UK. It's when you have... No. Order, please. It's when you have tax competition that's the problem because you end up in a spiral of decline. That's the problem that we have. 